Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. To my loyal bed crimers, so great to have you back. To anyone new, welcome. Before I get started, let me just ask that if after listening to this episode, you find you either enjoyed it or learned something from it, please hit that like button. It helps so much. Now, let's jump right in. I wanted to share the latest details that law enforcement have released about the tragic case out of Moscow, Idaho. We now know that two of the victims were on the second floor and the other two were on the third floor. And according to the coroner, all four victims were found deceased in bed. So it doesn't sound like anyone was able to stand up and fight the perpetrator off from that position. Perhaps the biggest news in the case today, Monday, November 21st, comes from a Moscow Police Department press release, and it is that the two surviving roommates, the young women who lived on the lowest level of the home, summoned some of their friends to the house on the morning of Sunday, November 13th. According to the police, the two roommates thought that one of the second floor victims had perhaps passed out, was unconscious, and was not waking up. Now it appears that these summoned friends arrived at the multi-level home before anyone dialed 911 to ask for help. Now, this is worrisome from an evidence perspective. More people walking around that house makes for more DNA there and possibly contamination of the evidence. Maybe the surviving roommates did not realize they were dealing with a crime scene situation, but the bottom line is It's probably not good for the investigation that additional people were walking around the home before the police were able to lock it down and put up yellow crime scene tape. It's odd that the two surviving roommates felt that at least one of the people on the second floor was unconscious. From the way the coroner described the crime scene, It was pretty messy, and there was red stuff on the walls, the same red stuff we saw dripping down the outside wall, and all the victims were found in bed. How did the roommates and their friends not notice any of that, and or not notice, and I hate to say this, the color of the person in bed? The coroner, while saying that it's not possible to determine which student was attacked first, did estimate that all the victims were attacked, and I quote, early in the morning, sometime after 2 a.m., but still during the night, end quote. I think by saying, but still during the night, the coroner is expressing that it was still dark outside, that the sun had yet to come up. She also said that all four students were found in bed and were likely sleeping when they were attacked. If they all passed away, perhaps between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m., within 15 to 30 minutes of passing away, the person would have turned very, very pale. This is because without the heart pumping, blood cannot circulate throughout the system. After a few hours, say starting within two hours after the last breath, rigor mortis begins to set in. And this is when things go from being completely limp to completely stiff. Even the last facial expression will be set in stone, providing clues to how someone passed away. So rigor mortis sets in about two hours post the last breath, and it usually peaks at the 12-hour mark. The 911 call, which was made from inside the house from one of the surviving roommate's phones, was made at 11.58 a.m., just two minutes before noon. 
That would be about eight hours after 4 a.m. Rigor mortis was in full swing at that point, provided the coroner got the time estimate correct. So that would likely look weird to someone peeking in the room, maybe. And without the heart beating, the blood would be at the mercy of gravity. This means it would pool in the parts touching the ground, or in this case, touching the bed. This is called lividity. So where the blood settled, the skin would at first appear red, but by the six to eight hour mark would be bluish purple. So there were a lot of weird signs that the surviving roommates would have seen if they'd gotten up close to their roommates on that second floor. But maybe the surviving roommates didn't go too far into the bedrooms. Perhaps they were getting spooky vibes or felt the unnatural stillness in the house, the lack of movement, and the lack of the normal sounds of an average Sunday morning. I would think that there would be a weird vibe in the house after such an event and other signs of the attack as well. But if the surviving roommates didn't see the red stuff, why did they feel the need to call additional friends over to the house? Why did they need backup friend power if they were under the impression that the second floor roommate was perhaps just unconscious? I'm thinking that maybe the roommates knew it was more than simply an unconscious roommate, but they were afraid to say that to the 911 operator for some reason. Or perhaps they really didn't know the extent of what had happened, so they called their friends over to take a look and get advice. And that's when someone said, hey, you need to call the police. I don't know, but this whole part of the story feels weird to me. But these are young students, and they're likely from loving homes with parents who keep an eye on them most of the time. They likely aren't war-hardened toughies who've seen it all at that point, or people who live in Hell's Kitchen in New York City. And let's face it, they probably had never found themselves in such a predicament, right? Here's how the police department's press release put it. On the morning of November 13th, the surviving roommates summoned friends to the residence because they believed one of the second floor victims had passed out and was not waking up, end quote. So the friends show up, and at some point, they say, dial 911. Note that the police are still not saying which of the roommates' phones was used to make that call, nor have they released the names of the people who spoke to the dispatch operator. The police did say, though, that multiple people got on the phone and spoke to the 911 dispatch operator. By the way, Moscow Police Captain Roger Lanier made it very clear on Sunday during the televised press conference that neither of the surviving roommates is considered a suspect. The police have also ruled out the guy near the food truck wearing the white hoodie and the private party driver who took Kaylee and Madison home early Sunday morning. The police have also stated that all four victims returned to the residence around 1.45 a.m. on Sunday morning. So they all turned up at the same time, which is also rather strange. One of the mysteries of all of this is where did Zana Kernadel and Ethan Chapin go after they left the party at the Sigma Chi Fraternity House at 9 p.m.? Note that this frat house is located on a hill just across a field and just a few minutes walk from the student's home 
at 1122 King Road. In fact, it's been said that you can practically see the two houses from each other. And a little further up the hill from the frat house on the campus is the entrance to the University of Idaho's Arboretum and Botanical Garden. The authorities have said that Zana and Ethan were at a party at that frat house from 8 to 9 p.m. Saturday night, and that they arrived at Zana's shared off-campus house on King Road at 1.45 a.m. So where did Zana and Ethan go after the frat party? Is this a critical detail of the night, or doesn't it matter? We don't yet know. I'm hoping the investigators will be able to piece it all together. We do know from Zana's father that he spoke to his daughter around midnight, and she was fine at that time. However, it's unclear where exactly Zana was when she spoke to her dad. We don't have this problem with Kaylee Gonsalves and Madison Mogan. We know they were at the Corner Club, a local Moscow bar on the edge of Main Street, from about 10 p.m. Saturday night until 1.30 a.m., Sunday morning. After that, the two best friends picked up some pasta from the grub truck, which was parked on Main Street, and then they were driven home by a private party car. So unlike Zana Cornado and Ethan Chapin, Kaylee and Madison's time on Saturday and Sunday prior to arriving home at 1.45 a.m., is pretty much all accounted for. Moving on to the strange series of phone calls that Kaylee Gonsalves made to her ex-boyfriend, Jack Ducur, between 2.30 a.m. and 2.52 a.m. Kaylee dialed Jack's number seven times from her cell phone. Then, Madison's phone dialed Jack three more times, most people believe that Kaylee may be asked to borrow Madison's phone to make these three additional calls to her ex-boyfriend. However, I haven't seen anywhere where the police have said that. I also have not heard that from Kaylee's sister, Olivia Gonsalves. Note that today, Monday, November 21st, investigators said that they are aware of the 10 phone calls made to Jack, and the investigators have revealed that they are looking into Jack. That should really come as no surprise to anyone because the police always have to look at the people closest to the victims, their inner circle, and Jack DeCur would have been in Kaylee's inner circle even if they had recently broken up, and especially because of those 10 phone calls made to Jack early Sunday morning. The cops would be remiss if they ignored this Jack guy. And while the police are checking Jack DeCur out, Kaylee's mom is saying that the police are, and I quote, wasting their time with Jack. She is standing by him, and she's confident that he has nothing whatsoever to do with this crime. Note that when a reporter asked if the ex-boyfriend Jack was ruled out as a suspect during this past Sunday's press conference, Police Chief Fry said, and I quote, everything we have taken from those calls we followed up on, we've cleared, and we believe there's no connection there, end quote. So it's a tad confusing to hear that out of Chief Fry on Sunday and then today to hear that investigators are looking into Jack. The Moscow police have scheduled yet another press conference for this Wednesday, November 23rd at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. I get the feeling that the hundreds of detectives and investigators assigned to the case are working around the clock and are very keen on getting the perpetrator caught as soon as possible. At least I hope that's what they're doing. 
and let's hope they are successful. I have to say that if they caught this person before Thanksgiving, that would be something we could all rejoice over and be thankful for. This past Sunday, relatives, friends, and local volunteers combed through the grounds of the Arboretum and the Botanical Gardens on the university's campus in search of anything that looks like a clue. According to an article in the Independent newspaper, the grassroots efforts were organized by Sheldon Kernodal. He's a cousin of Zana Kernodal. Per this article, at least a dozen people were there wearing name tags and they were conducting something akin to a grid search near the campus entrance to the gardens on a hill just a stone's throw away from the crime scene. The article described the scene as follows, and I quote, Stepping carefully, shaking trees and brush, and even crawling on their bellies, the volunteers were looking for just whatever we can find, said another man who declined to speak on record. Others, joining in, were passing out flyers and taping them to lamppost, businesses, and anything they could find in Moscow. Sorry, it's Moscow. It's so hard to remember that. But they refused to speak to the independent. There are also signs of frustration at this point among the grieving family members of the victims and locals to the area. Some are understandably upset at the lack of progress on the case after more than a week, and people in Moscow are afraid. They don't know if this is someone who did this in a moment of rage, or if this is someone who is starting out on a spree, as in a serialist starting out on a spree. One student who works at a chain restaurant down the road from the campus told The Independent that before this happened, she'd walk miles around the area even at night, but now she's afraid to walk alone to her car. And who can blame her? Some people are saying they're worried that the police have botched the investigation. Some sources told OK Magazine the following, and I quote, The reality is this evidence was likely obliterated, and if the cops had done things correct, those tire marks would have been photographed, measured, and preserved on the day when the victims were found. The time that elapsed between when the bodies were found and the forensics team returned to the crime scene allowed crucial evidence to be corrupted by weather or other activity. End quote. Whoever this insider is also said the following, and I quote, with no suspect, no red rum weapon, and little to no leads, you have to ask the question, did the police botch the investigation from the get-go? End quote. Obviously, that person did not say the word red rum. I'm saying it because I don't want YouTube to penalize my video. It's upsetting to hear that some people think that the investigation has already been botched. You never want anyone to be saying that just a week out from the crime. I'm going to remain hopeful because the students' families need hope that this case will be solved, that they will get answers and justice for their loved ones, and that whoever did this will be punished. So that person was just talking about tire marks. Those tire marks that were mentioned were on the pavement outside the students' shared house at 1122 King Road. Investigators were seen measuring the tire marks. It looks like someone might have tore out of there after the crime, and we did hear that a white vehicle was seen parked there at some point early Sunday morning. 
That's a detail to jot down in your case notes. I'm going to try to figure out who among the inner circle may drive or have access to a white vehicle. Note that as of today, investigators were seen expanding the crime scene from the house out toward the wooded area behind the residence and, of course, into the road where those tire marks were. It is believed that they were searching in the woods for the sharp-edged instrument that the perpetrator used and that he, and I'm going to say he because I think most criminal profilers believe that this is a male, that he may have dumped on his way out. Speaking of hope in the investigation, let's talk a little bit about DNA. A case informant told the independent newspaper the following, and I quote, If there was a struggle between the victim and the offender, which it's believed there was in at least one of the cases, it is almost certain that biological debris will be found beneath the fingernails, end quote. We know from Zana Kernado's father that Zana showed signs of fighting off the attacker. She had bruising indicative of a struggle. If DNA is located, the police will be able to run it through CODIS to see if anyone's name pops up. They can also ask any persons of interest, if they have any at that point, to share a sample of their DNA, and that can be compared to what was found under the victim's fingernails. I'm praying that Zana Kernado and whoever else may have fought off the attacker will have the DNA debris necessary to, and th there's no pun intended here, nail the perpetrator. Zana could be key to solving this horrendous crime. Fingers crossed, prayers being sent out to the universe. Let's hope that happens. And keep an eye out for that Moscow Police Department press conference I told you about earlier. It is scheduled for this Wednesday, November 23rd at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories. Hey, do me a favor. Hit that like button, subscribe, leave me a comment, consider a membership, and you can also leave me, if you feel like it, a one-time donation to my Patreon if you want to support the work I do here. Charlie D'Amelio, check! Guys, I met Charlie D'Amelio, check! Guys, I met Charlie D'Amelio, check! Guys, I met Charlie D'Amelio, check!